Okay, wonderful. So uh, good evening. My name is Shannon Hulst. I am the floodplain specialist for Barnstable County through Cape Cod Cooperative Extension and Woods Hole Sea Grant. So I am going to be talking about all things flood insurance um, on the Cape and specifically in Brewster as well this evening. Uh, so thanks for being with us. Whoops. To start, I want to uh, give a shout out to our homeowner's handbook to prepare for coastal hazards. We released the third edition of this handbook last July. Uh, this is a, a little handbook that gives all kinds of information, not just on flood insurance, but also on all kinds of things on how to protect your home from coastal storms uh, and other things um, related. Oops. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, how to protect your, your home or business or whatever it is from flooding, from wind, from all kinds of things. Uh, the, the meteorological background of tropical storms and nor'easters, it's got all kinds of good information in it. And there are hard copies available at the Brewster Ladies Library, as well as many other libraries across the Cape. Uh, so that is available. So feel free to pick up your copy today. So moving into flood insurance and flood risk. So Flood risk on Cape Cod. Uh, these are the floodplains. The dark blue areas is that's the regulatory floodplain. The light blue area um, is a moderate risk floodplain. Everywhere else is a low risk floodplain. We say everywhere has some flood risk because it rains. Uh, just this afternoon, we had a big thunderstorm. Um, anywhere that it rains, it can flood. Uh, 52,000 acres of our, um, of our land on the Cape are in floodplains. Uh, that's about 20% of our land area. We have about 30,000 structures. Uh, that means that any of those structures that have a mortgage have to have flood insurance. It means that regulations that apply to um, development apply in all of these areas. So we have a lot of land that is subject to those regulations and the flood insurance requirements. So looking a little bit more closely at Brewster, uh, since we are with the Brewster Ladies Library this evening, uh, this, this is the, um, the floodplain in Brewster. Uh, again, the dark is the regulatory floodplain. So we do have, um, we do have some floodplain. I will say that Brewster has one of the smaller floodplains on the Cape because the, um, the shoreline has such a steep um, bluff there, which is good news for many Brewster citizens, but uh, there are areas that are still regulatory floodplain, moderate risk floodplain, and again, as we just said, um, if it rains, it can flood. So there is flood risk everywhere. And here we go. Uh, this was taken from the uh, Brewster Coastal Adaptation Plan. This is just one zooming in on the shoreline change and sea level rise. Uh, projections. So these are all possible sea level rise and storm surge scenarios. So the floodplain that we have right now is not the floodplain that we are going to be dealing with in the future. With sea level rise, the floodplains are going to expand. So we saw the floodplain that we have right now, it will be larger in the future. So there will be more areas subject to risk from flooding. Okay, so now we've, we've gone a little bit over, very briefly, over what the flood risk is. So now we know that there is some flood risk. Should that really matter to you? Well, we've got a, a few things to talk about here. So the first thing to discuss is that 20% of flood claims come from places where flood risk is low. So all of those areas in the past couple of slides that were not blue, uh, those are places where flood 20% of flood claims still come from because those maps are imperfect and there's a lot of rain. Um, as we have seen more and more recently, again, you can have flood damage and uh, flood claims from rainfall. So a lot of flood claims come from outside of the floodplain. So just because you're not in a regulatory floodplain, if you're not in a floodplain, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have flood insurance. The next item, just one inch of water can cause $25,000 of damage to your home. A lot of people don't realize just how much damage water can cause. So this is another good thing to keep in mind. Uh, this is um, talking about over the past 20 years, the typical household that received 
some sort of post-disaster assistance, post-flood assistance. So the typical household that received some sort of assistance received $36,000 in rebuilding assistance from the National Flood Insurance Program, and those without flood insurance coverage received only $4,000 in FEMA aid. Um, that is, those are averages, those numbers are, are generally kind of all over the place, but it gives a really good demonstration that without flood insurance, people think that, oh, FEMA will come in and, and make me whole again and help me recover. Um, the average is payment after disaster is $4,000 from FEMA whereas it's nine times that high from the flood insurance program. Um, so um, there's, there's a, a, a good reason to have flood insurance and not to count on aid from FEMA because it maxes out at $30,000 and it's not very likely that you'll actually receive that $30,000 in coverage. Again, the average is 4,000. This is a, a little bit of a busier graphic. Um, but the red box areas are what I want to bring your attention to. I will say this is also from Texas. Um, so uh, it's not a local, local graphic. Um, I borrowed all of these graphics from FEMA or others, but there are some really good points here. So if we start on, on the top right here, some flood insurance facts. So we already heard that one inch can cause of water can cause $25,000 in damage. This gives us a little bit more information. So for a 2000 square foot home, six inches can cause about $40,000 and a foot over $50,000 in damage. Uh, so there can be a lot of damage and it can be to the structure, it can be to the contents. Um, I've heard from folks who have had to replace their utilities twice in back-to-back -back years because they, they didn't elevate them after they got flooded the first time and that cost them $50,000 alone just to replace their utilities. So when you do have a flood, even though they're not very common in most areas, they can cost a lot of money. And then uh, looking on the left side here, so federal disaster assistance is usually a loan that has to be paid back. It's not just free money. So if, if you were to get a $50,000 loan, which uh, you probably wouldn't get with federal disaster assistance, but say you were able to get that loan somewhere to help recover from that flood damage and didn't have flood insurance, you'd be paying about $240 a month or just under $3,000 a year for 30 years to pay back that loan. Whereas if you have $100,000 in flood insurance coverage, that's around $33 a month or $400 a year and you would get back um, a lot more money toward your flood damage. And then uh, the final thing I wanna point out on this slide is that uh, in most cases, it does take 30 days for a flood insurance policy to become effective. The reason for that is that uh, the flood insurance program can't really manage people who see a hurricane coming right at them, who go and buy a policy and then drop it as soon as the hurricane passes. Uh, so it's, it's trying to discourage that and, and encourage folks to uh, have their policy ready um, all year round. So uh, now we've been over some reasons why you would be potentially interested in having flood insurance and what our flood risk is. Uh, so now I'm going to delve into the National Flood Insurance Program. The reason that I'm going to focus on the National Flood Insurance Program is that um, there is a private market. There are some private companies that will offer flood insurance, um, but most policies are still with the National Flood Insurance Program. That's in part because it still tends to be the most affordable for the best coverage in most cases, not all, um, but also because a lot of people have flood insurance because they have to. Uh, I mentioned earlier that if a home with a mortgage is located in one of those dark blue areas, uh, dark blue floodplains on an earlier map, um, they have to have flood insurance. And that's a, a regulation from the National Flood Insurance Program that comes from Congress. and uh, any, any flood insurance policy has to meet certain requirements and the National Flood Insurance Program or NFIP policies all meet those requirements, whereas the private companies have a little bit harder time often meeting those requirements. So, uh, so that's why I'm going to focus on the National Flood Insurance Program. It is a public program managed by the federal government, so it is not promoting any, any one business over another. So delving into this, uh, this graphic I borrowed from New York City, but was able to slip Brewster uh, name and numbers in there. Uh, so this is a timeline going over the evolution of flood insurance. So 
There was the Great Mississippi Flood in 1927. Uh, it's not on here, but there were a series of hurricanes in the 50s. And at that time, no private company was offering flood insurance because it was only those people that really needed it who were acquiring it. Uh, and then they would only be paying out um, every time that, that there was a flood. It just, it just wasn't making sense for the private market to pick up flood insurance. So people were not able to get insured for flooding. And then at the same time, the federal government was paying out huge amounts of post-disaster recovery funding to private homeowners who, again, didn't have flood insurance. So in 1968, they created the National Flood Insurance Program with the intention that the people that are at the highest risk and that maybe would be looking for um, that assistance from the federal government after a flood could now pay into a program and pay for their fair share of the risk so that all taxpayers weren't just paying for their recovery. So this was the theory uh, to have them pay in and pay for their risk and it would just be managed by the federal government because again, the private market wasn't interested. Um, in 1973 is when the mandatory flood insurance purchase requirement became effective. So that's what I've been talking about with any property that, that's located in a floodplain has to have flood insurance. That's been in effect since 73. Um, the 1979 FEMA was established. The NFIP started in, in HUD, but then moved to FEMA. Um, in 1985 is when Brewster adopted its first flood insurance rate map. That's when the National Flood Insurance Program regulations became effective in the town. So that has to do with building and some other development regulations. In fact, um, at the next town meeting, um, Brewster will be looking at a floodplain bylaw. And that's just to meet the bare minimum requirements of the National Flood Insurance Program to make sure that the town continues to participate in the program. And those folks who do have flood insurance or need flood insurance for the, their mortgage will be able to uh, maintain that flood insurance and therefore their mortgages. So when you see that come up, um, either on the Brewster town warrant or if you are in another town, it's going to be coming up on every single town uh, town meeting at some point in the future. So um, that is what that bylaw is. So uh, in 2005, 2005 is significant because this is when Hurricane Katrina hits the Gulf Coast. There were also um, a couple of other hurricanes that hit, hit at the same time. Of course, people are aware that Katrina was a really significant hurricane, but why it is most significant for the National Flood Insurance Program is because that is when the program became no longer solvent. Um, it was, it used to work that the number of premiums that it, it took in covered the claims that it paid out. When Katrina hit, that was no longer the case. So since 2005, the National Flood Insurance Program has had to borrow from the federal treasury to cover the cost of the claims it has paid out. Um, and that is uh, seen as unfair in a lot of people's eyes because again, it's, it's all of the taxpayers helping to pay to help these um, folks who are in floodplains um, recover from their disasters. So that led to a series of, um, of reforms. The, in 2012 and 2014, the Bigger Waters Act and the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act Basically, what those came down to is that um, for primary homeowners, your flood insurance rates, if, if you were, um, if your structure was built before 1985, if you're in Brewster, if the dates are different for other towns, but 85 for Brewster, um, then you've been getting what's called a subsidized flood insurance rate. You haven't been paying based on your real risk. You've been paying based on the fact that you couldn't build to code because there was no code if you built before 85. Uh, so they're trying to not penalize folks who were who built before these regulations became effective. Um, but now they're saying, Congress is saying uh, everybody needs to pay their fair share based on their real risk uh, because the program cannot manage anymore. It's, it's $30, $30 billion in debt to the federal treasury. So uh, these reforms are trying to correct that. So if those, uh, those properties that were um, built before 85 and have flood insurance policies, if they're primary homes, their rates are going up at 18% a year. If they're second homes, if they are repetitive loss properties, if they're businesses, their rates are going up at 25% a year until they reach uh, their cap of, um, of full risk, full risk rate. 
Um, and that is changing a little bit. Um, and that I will get into later because that is actually a different thing from these reforms and statutory changes. So um, what's important here is that it's rates are increasing if you were built before 85 by either 18% or 25% a year. And in a lot of cases, they're increasing for folks who are built after 85 as well, but just not increasing as much. So moving on from the basic history of the flood insurance program, so where do you get flood insurance? So the first step is to start with your existing insurance. If you own your home and you have homeowner's insurance, start with whoever provides that. There's a good chance that they will be able to get you a flood insurance policy. There are several uh, kind of middlemen insurance providers who will write flood insurance policies with the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, it's not, they may have names um, that are not immediately recognized recognizable as the National Flood Insurance Program, but they are still written with the NFIP. Um, so it, it's, it's a kind of multi-step process if you go with your existing insurer, but it's, it's often cleaner that way. Uh, however, if that doesn't work um, and they can't get you a flood insurance policy, then what you do instead is go to floodsmart.gov, which is FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program website. It has the answers to all of your flood insurance questions. Uh, and you go to the section of buying a policy, uh, and then you look for finding a flood insurance provider. And you can pull up Massachusetts, you can show within um, 10 miles, I think, or, or how many, you can show how many um, hits you wanna see. And then that's going to bring up those kind of middlemen insurance providers that I mentioned. So you could work directly with one of them instead of going through uh, your own insurance company. So however you want to do it, you can access it. Um, access flood insurance, anyone can access flood insurance. You do not have to be in a floodplain to get flood insurance. Uh, again, 20% uh, of claims come from outside of those, um, those floodplains and anywhere it rains, it can flood. Uh, so FEMA really does encourage anyone and everyone to have a flood insurance policy. The costs are cheaper if you're not in a floodplain, a designated floodplain. So uh, it's an even better idea to get a policy if you are outside of the floodplain. So let's move on to coverage for flood insurance. So what does flood insurance with the National Flood Insurance Program cover? Uh, it covers overflow of inland or tidal waters, so that would be your storm surge. Um, it covers runoff caused by heavy rainfall in a short period of time that overwhelms the drainage or absorption capabilities of an area. So that's, that's what we've been seeing a lot of lately. Um, we have here on the Cape had some of that. Uh, just this past summer, really this past month and a half. Um, in 2017, we had some really big rainstorms. Uh, I think East Ham had eight inches in, uh, in an hour or something. Um, at the county, one of our buildings, two of our buildings flooded uh, because of this rain. Basically, we're getting rain um, in such heavy volumes that our um, stormwater systems were not designed to handle that amount of rain and the ground can't absorb it that quickly. And if you're in a really urban area that has a lot of impervious paved surface like New York City um, during Ida, that then the, the rain can't obviously um, absorb it all into the ground. So that's what caused all of those big flooding issues in Ida. Um, so certainly runoff and heavy rainfall is um, something that we have to be increasingly aware of um, and is a, a cause of flooding that is covered by the flood insurance program. Mud flow, uh, a little less common here, um, but uh, is still covered here and everywhere in the country. Um, it's caused by heavier sustained rainfall that accumulates and forms a river of liquid and flowing mud down a hillside. And then erosion, when the overflow of a body of water causes shorelines to wear away or collapse suddenly, we certainly have a lot of erosion here and that is only going to be covered by flood insurance. Homeowners insurance will not cover that sort of damage. Um, so these are the basic causes. There are some other things like if your neighbor's pool collapses and both of your properties flood, that will be covered. Um, but if, your, uh, if a pipe bursts in your house, uh, that's going to be covered by your homeowner's insurance rather than flood insurance. So the cause is really important in understanding which insurance applies. 
Uh, okay, moving on to coverage uh, for a building. So you can get flood insurance coverage for the structure and also for the content. So we'll cover contents next. So uh, for residential, for a structure, you can get up to 250,000 in coverage and 500,000 for commercial. Um, this is something that Congress is taking a closer look at. These numbers were based on the value of structures a few decades ago. Uh, so that is something that could be updated and is in a series of reforms that Congress um, may or may not pass. It was due to be passed in 2017 uh, and has continued to be extended. Um, hopefully it gets passed uh, Thursday, um, but that'll get, it, it's rolled into the, uh, the budget um, things that need to pass on Thursday. So um, it may or may not uh, pass at this point. It won't, this won't be reformed. It will just be an extension of the program, but hopefully sometime soon Congress picks that back up and extends that, uh, that number. Um, it also covers um, for the building, electrical and plumbing systems, furnaces and hot water heaters, refrigerators, cooking stoves, and built-in appliances. So these are specifically built-in appliances. Other appliances, appliances are covered under contents. Permanently installed carpeting, permanently installed cabinets, panel and bookcases, window blinds, foundation walls, anchor system staircases. Uh, it does cover detached garages as well, um, and fuel tanks, well water tanks and pumps and solar energy equipment. So anything that is needed to operate the structure um, as a home or a business, whatever it is, um, but separate things. So the detached garages are covered, but typically other structures are not. Um, for example, a seawall is something that comes up as a frequent question. Can that be covered by flood insurance? No. Um, they will only cover a building or the contents. Um, so these are the things that fall under the building coverage. And moving on to the contents coverage. So you can have up to 100,000 of coverage, dollars in coverage for residential and up to $500,000 in coverage for commercial. Um, this covers personal belongings, clothing, furniture, electronics, uh, curtains, which are apparently defined differently than window blinds, um, washer and dryer, those are typically not built in appliances, uh, portable and window air conditioners, again, not built in, microwave, uh, carpets that are um, not permanently installed, uh, and then also valuable items um, such as artwork and furs, although uh, there is a limit on those uh, that actually just came up today as a question from someone. Uh, so there is a two hundred fifty, sorry, $2,500 limit on those valuable items. Beyond that, you would need to get a separate insurance policy to cover that. Um, so this is all the contents, all of your belongings inside the house that are different from the functioning of the house itself. The house can still function as a house without these things in it. So that's contents coverage. So now there are some limitations with coverage as well that um, I have heard uh, from a lot of folks who didn't realize these, these limitations. Um, and then they end up getting a smaller flood insurance policy or payout than they anticipated, or they thought that they were covered and, and they're not covered for these items. Uh, and I will say that a common uh, criticism of the flood insurance program is that it just doesn't pay out as much as you would think it would. Um, and that that is, is true, um, but it is still better than not having any insurance coverage for flood damage. So some of the things that flood insurance does not cover it, cover that people are often unfortunately surprised by. Uh, temporary housing. So when you have a flood and you can't live in your home anymore, you have to live in a hotel or, or live elsewhere and you do, you incur additional living expenses. Uh, unfortunately, those cannot be covered by flood insurance. Any financial loss caused by business interruption. So if it's your business that's flooded, unfortunately, those are not covered by flood insurance either. Um, as I just mentioned, any property outside of the insured building, so uh, landscaping, wells, septic, decks, patios, fences, the seawall, uh, hot tub and swimming pool, those cannot be covered. But again, a detached garage can, um, but it's all these other things that cannot, that are separate from the structure. 
uh, currency, precious metals, stock certificates, and other valuable papers, those things that have value in and of themselves, uh, those cannot be covered. Uh, cars are not covered by flood insurance. Any flood damage to a car would be covered under the car insurance, not the flood insurance. Um, that comes up a lot. Uh, same thing with RVs, actually. Uh, RVs are considered a vehicle, so they cannot be covered by flood insurance unless they are permanently installed uh, as if they are a building. Um, so those that can be a little bit of a tricky definition, but typically an RV is not covered under flood insurance. And then also personal property that's kept in basement. So that unfortunately is probably one of the, or really is the biggest challenge that I hear from folks on the Cape is they have flood insurance, they have a flood, they have a basement because so many of us do here and it's their their property, their personal property, their contents uh, that's in their basement that gets damaged and they file a claim and find that that is not eligible. Um, so unfortunately that is true. No personal property in the basement can be covered. The only thing in a basement that's covered is the structure itself, uh, the washer and dryer and a fridge freezer and the food in the fridge or freezer. Nothing else is covered. Um, and that's because the likelihood of flooding in a basement is so high, um, it just doesn't make sense for the flood insurance program to cover those because it's it's almost inevitable that there will be damage to them. So, um, and now if, if a structure is built new in a floodplain, basements are not allowed. Um, so they're, the flood insurance program through the regulatory side and the insurance side um, is slowly working on that. Um, but, uh, Certainly, there are a lot of basements still, so that's probably the most important thing for folks on, on the Cape to know is that there is very limited coverage in a basement. All right, there we go. So moving on from the coverage uh, and looking at, or the, the specific, specifics of what is covered, uh, let's just take a quick look at flood insurance coverage on the Cape. So only 35% of structures, even in the floodplain, actually have flood insurance. So that's not 35% of structures total. It is 35% of structures just in the floodplain. Um, I, as a uh, government employee, get nervous about that because when we do have a really big storm, our first line of defense is flood insurance. In order for our communities to be able to recover, we need people to be able to rely on themselves to recover their own personal losses. And the best way to do that is by having insurance. Um, we do have some folks here who opt to self-insure. Uh, they have the means to do that and that's okay too. They can do that. We just want our insurance, our insurance, we want our communities to come back in one piece. We want all of our, um, our residents to come back and to, mean, to be able to maintain the same kind of community character that we've had in the past. Uh, we don't want people to have to leave here because they can't afford to stay because of their flood damage. And we have seen that happen in a lot of other parts of the country. So um, clearly I'm, I'm spending a lot of time saying that having flood insurance is a good idea, um, but that, that is why. So looking, delving a little bit deeper, um, the average premium in the floodplain on the Cape is $2,500. In Brewster, it is $3,200. Uh, so actually, I believe Brewster has the highest average on the Cape. However, that is because Brewster has very few policies compared to other communities. So those few policies have higher numbers, um, higher average premiums. Um, the average cost outside of the floodplain in Brewster is only $400. So again, in those areas where it rains, but you don't have a risk from storm surge, um, it's really relatively uh, cheap. And again, this is, this is an annual premium. It's not a monthly premium. So uh, that $400 would be uh, on an annual basis. Cape wide, we have 10,000 policies. Um, we have 110 in Brewster, 25 of those are in the floodplain. So that, that is the smallest number on the Cape, 25 policies in the floodplain. Um, however, you can see that um, more than four times or, or about four times that um, are, is the number of policies total. So uh, there are 85 policies that are not in the floodplain, which is great. Uh, which means that all of those folks, those 85 um, people who have flood insurance and are not in the floodplain uh, will get some coverage when we do have rain damage. 
Um, and then uh, this is my, my PSA reminder, um, flood damage is not covered in a homeowner policy. It has to be a separate policy. Unfortunately, a lot of people have flood damage and then they call their insurance company and they say, you know, they try to file a claim for their, their flood damage. And that's when they find out that flooding isn't covered by their homeowner's insurance. So it's, it's best to find that out before, uh, before you have a flood claim and before you get denied by your homeowner's insurance company um, because you don't have coverage for that flooding. So good to be aware of. Uh, a few other items on flood insurance rates. So I mentioned this at the beginning, but just to bring this up again, um, there are currently 18% annual increases for primary homes on houses built before 1985. And then there are 25% annual increases for second homes, businesses, and repetitive loss properties. And again, those are also for those homes that were built before 1985 in Brewster. In other communities, that date is going to be a little bit different, but it's it's usually more or less around the mid 80s. Um, but if, if people, oops, if people do have questions about a specific community, um, I'm happy to answer that question if people want to reach out to me directly. So I mentioned earlier also that there is another change in addition to those that 18% and 25% increase. So the, this is what's called Risk Rating 2.0. This is a new program with the National Flood Insurance Program. They're changing how they are rating flood risk. So that is an insurance term, but they're, they're basically changing how they charge you uh, based on what they determine your flood risk to be. So how they determine your flood risk is changing. Uh, this actually goes into effect for new flood insurance policies on Friday. Uh, October 1st. And for anyone who's renewing a policy, they will switch into this new type of rating after they renew after April 1st next year. So April 1st, 2022, when you, if you already have a flood insurance policy and you renew after that, then you will be switched into this risk rating 2.0. So what to know about risk rating 2.0? It is property specific. Um, it's no longer based on, it used to be based on classes and flood zones. So basically it would be look at the whole flood zone and every house in the same, in the same flood zone had the same flood risk. And then it would take, um, it would put your house in a, a class of structure based on whether you had a basement or not uh, and some other factors. So now it's looking at each and every structure individually. It's based on the distance from the flooding source and the types of flooding. So it's looking at how far you, for us, it's mostly how far away you are from the coast, um, but also is there uh, a low spot near you where rain could, um, could pond? What, what types of flooding are you exposed to and how close are you to those sources? It also looks at the value of the structure. So a structure that would cost $100,000 to, rebuild is going to be charged a lower flood insurance rate than a structure that would cost $1 million to rebuild. Um, they are, FEMA is trying to build equity into their uh, flood insurance rating. So that is how they are doing that by looking at the value of the structure. No individual policy is to exceed $12,125. Uh, that seems like a lot, but there are some policies that pay nearly $50,000 a year in their flood insurance cost. Um, so that is going to change and drop that down. Again, those rate increases, uh, they are still there, but they are going to, um, your, your final target number of, of when the increases uh, stop, that may change, but there's still the annual 18% or 25% rate increases. Um, with risk rating 2.0, there will be a letter sent out to policyholders helping them understand their risk and explaining that better. Um, I hear from a lot of folks who say, uh, I've lived here for 30 years, it's never flooded. Um, and they assume that that means therefore it never will. Uh, the reality is that they've been lucky if they're in a floodplain, um, then they actually have a 26% chance over the course of a 30 year mortgage to flood. So they've been lucky um, that they haven't. And that, that risk just increases um, with more time and it will increase. We don't have the numbers or the data yet, but that will also increase with sea level rise and changes in precipitation. So. 
overall, uh, folks will understand their flood risk better and understand that just because it hasn't flooded there doesn't mean that it won't. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, it is going to be implemented for new policyholders this Friday, October 1st. And then for uh, existing policyholders, when they renew after April 1st of 2022, they will be switched into this new rating system. Uh, this is what the changes are going to look like, the cost changes are going to look like uh, for us here on the Cape. So the green in these pie charts shows a cost decrease. Um, this is the percentage of policyholders that are going to decrease. The light blue is increases up to $10. Statewide, we have 54% are going to increase up to $10 a month, so $120 a year. Um, the darker blue is increases up to $20 a month, which is $240 a year. 6% uh, of folks will be in that category. And then 4% are in the final category, which is the gray of increases of more than $20 a year, uh, so more than $240 a year. Uh, again, that's only 4% statewide. Um, in Brewster, again, there are 110 policies um, or about that. Um, 36 of those policies are decreasing. So exactly a third of the policies are decreasing. And then all of the other policies are increasing up to $10 a month or $120 a year. Brewster does not have any policies who are seeing higher increases than that. So that is great news for Brewster policyholders. And you can see that Cape Wide, um, that's really the case for most of our communities. Um, this is by zip code. Um, and you see very little gray on these, uh, on these pie charts. And it's mostly folks who are decreasing their flood insurance costs or uh, relatively minor increases. So that's what to expect with risk rating 2.0. And we'll see, obviously it hasn't rolled out yet, as I said. Uh, so we will see over the next year or so what it really looks like when it gets rolled out. Okay, moving on from flood insurance coverage and costs and everything, um, and looking at cost management, because flood insurance can be very expensive. As I mentioned, average cost on the Cape is 2,500 if you're in a floodplain, uh, and 3,200 if you're in the floodplain in Brewster, um, just based on the, the average cost of policies um, of folks who have flood insurance now. So ways to lower flood insurance costs. So I always recommend that folks start with an elevation certificate. An elevation certificate is something that is done by a surveyor and it basically gives you the, uh, it tells you what the elevation of the ground is and it tells you what the elevation of your first floor is. And both of those pieces of information are important for flood insurance rating. And uh, it'll make sure that you get the most accurate flood insurance rate and that FEMA isn't, isn't taking a guess at what those numbers are, which is what FEMA is doing now. They're taking an informed guess, but it's still a guess. Um, and it's much more accurate if you have an elevation certificate. An elevation certificate can also be used with a letter of map amendment. If, you, uh, if the ground around your structure is actually higher than the predicted level of flooding on the flood map, what's called the base flood elevation, then according to FEMA, you're not actually in the floodplain. And you can use that elevation certificate to submit it to FEMA with a letter of map amendment or get then a letter of map amendment. And that says that you're no longer in the floodplain. So a mortgage company can still require you to carry flood insurance but it's going to be a lot cheaper. And I would absolutely still recommend that you carry flood insurance because you're still going to be very close to that, that essentially imaginary line of where the water will stop in a flood. Um, but what this means is that you can pay that $400 rate of being outside of the floodplain rather than the $3,200 rate of being in the floodplain. Uh, so it's, it's a good deal if the land around your house works out that way. Sometimes we see stairs or deck being the one part of a house that um, is actually in the floodplain. And when that happens, um, it's very frustrating for the homeowner because it puts the whole house into the floodplain and then the whole house has to um, adhere to floodplain rules. If you're building, then there are certain elevation regulations um, or the whole house has to have flood insurance coverage for the mortgage. But if it is just the stairs or deck, then you can either relocate them to uh, you know, just change the angle sometimes. 
Um, or they can be structurally detached from the house. And then with the proper documentation of that, then the house is, is no longer considered in the floodplain, as long as it's very clear that those things are structurally detached. Other things that you can do if, if you're kind of out of luck, if the whole house is very clearly in a floodplain, can't get that letter of map amendment, it's not just your deck that's in the floodplain. Uh, elevation is the absolute best thing that you can do to protect your home from flooding. Um, Filling in the basement is uh, is another thing. So again, we we have a lot of basements here. Um, so filling that in that helps to protect the structure um, because when if you have a flood and the the pressure of the water on the outside of the foundation, especially when it's hollow, when it's a it's a basement, um, it can crack the foundation because the pressure is just too uh, too high from the outside with nothing pushing out on it from the inside. So that's why basements are no longer allowed in the floodplain, um, and that's why you can fill the basement and then either put in flood vents so that equalizes the pressure, um, put those into the foundation. They're they're basically um, they look like air vents in a crawl space. Um, but there are flood vent, they, there are certain kinds that are insulated, so it stays warmer, uh, kinds that float open, so they stay closed and keep critters out and trash and debris and everything. Um, and then if, if that, if you, if you can't um, just put in flood vents to improve the flood safety, then you can elevate the structure. Um, that is a, a much more cost intensive option, but it, it is certainly done. Um, you see it often after people have been flooded one or two times and they're, they're sick of being flooded. Uh, so then they elevate the structure um, up higher and well above the floodwaters uh, and then their flood insurance costs uh, drop and they are also much safer. Uh, I do have here to talk to an insurance agent because they are the ones that are going to tell you for sure if they uh, if what you're going to do is going to lower your rate. Sometimes there are some weird quirky things that happen. So anything that you do to lower your flood insurance rate, you want to run that by your insurance agent to make sure that you are actually going to get that lower flood insurance rate. So I mentioned um, cost. So with elevation, this is a this is a graphic that shows under the current rating system, the one that's uh, that's effective right now. Um, that's not going to change uh, or the, different than the one that's coming on October 1st. Um, so these are some numbers uh, that will still be essentially um, effective for the new rating system. Um, you can see um, the house all the way on the left is a structure that is four feet below base flood elevation or that expected level of flooding. They're paying almost $10,000 a year because it's so far below that expected level of flooding and has a really high risk. The middle house is right at that base flood elevation with flood vents and that drops all the way down to $1,400 a year. And then the house on the right with three feet above the expected level of flooding is down to $427 a year. So there is a really big difference. Elevation is by far the best thing you can do to both improve the safety of your structure and everything that is in it, and also to lower those flood insurance premiums. And then how do you actually make these things happen? So you can do it voluntarily. There are people that, again, just get sick of flooding or just don't want to risk the flooding and they opt to elevate their homes, move their utilities, fill in their basement, whatever it is. Um, sometimes it's a regulatory thing, a substantial improvement or substantial damage. Those happen when somebody, um, if, if it's improvement, they are putting in 50% or more of the market value of worth of changes into the structure, then it triggers uh, a rule that the whole structure has to come into compliance. So typically that means it has to be elevated. Same thing if it's damaged 50% or more of the market value, uh, then it, when it's rebuilt, it will have to be elevated and brought up to code. So sometimes these the mitigation happens just because there are all these other changes that people are making to their home and they have to make the flood changes as well. There are also sometimes FEMA grants available for this uh, to elevate. I will say the FEMA grants are very, very difficult um, to obtain, but they are there. Um, and if folks are interested, then I'm happy to give more information on that. Um, 
And then HUD assistance. So Housing and Urban Development, uh, another federal department, they have uh, something called the 203K loan. That is for low income homeowners. Uh, they can take out a loan to make home improvements. And it, among those home improvements are flood mitigation um, measures. So that was approved within the last 10 years that you could use that for flood mitigation. So that's a way to help folks uh, who might be a little more financially strapped to make these changes. And then uh, the final thing here wrapping up um, is something that your community can do for you to help lower your flood insurance costs and make your community safer at the same time. So this is the community rating system. This is a program within the National Flood Insurance Program. It rewards communities that take on higher standards and really put a lot of effort into flood resilience. And it rewards them by offering discounts on flood insurance in exchange for those actions that are reducing flood risk. Um, so my position was created in 2015 to help the communities join this program because it has the dual benefits of the flood insurance discounts and also helping communities take on these actions um, that improve flood resiliency. So uh, the actions that, that do that, um, so it's, it's an incentive. The program is an incentive to take those on. Um, it's easier to get things through town meeting when you can say, well, this also saves money. Um, so it's, it's a good incentive. Uh, it's, it improves building code enforcement and awareness. Open space preservation is, um, earns the most credit in this program, because if you have open space, then you aren't going to have structures that are filing flood claims. You're not gonna have any risk to human life if nobody's living there. Uh, and on the, on the Cape, um, we have a whole lot of open space in floodplains. So uh, this serves the Cape really, really well, um, both from a flood protection standard um, standpoint and also from um, the community rating system and flood insurance discount standpoint. Public education is another component of the CRS. Um, there are letters that often go out on an annual basis. Um, having that homeowner's handbook available at the library is um, public education that uh, gets credit. Um, if this presentation were something to be done on an annual basis, this would get credit. Uh, so there's, there's a lot. Public education is also uh, very important to this. Um, and then it, the, the CRS comes with a manual uh, that is a very long intensive manual uh, that gives ideas for advanced floodplain management. So communities can also look to that and say, we want to make our floodplain safer. We want to make our community safer. So how, how do we do that? And then uh, final slide here, this shows the communities that are in the CRS. So we have nine communities that are in the program now and four more that are somewhere in the application process. Um, there's a lot of demand for this program right now and uh, FEMA region one serves all of New England. So they are, they're a bit overwhelmed with requests to join the program um, and there are not many of them. So, oops. Um, so there are, um, there are folks uh, that they just, they have a heavy workload so they will get to us, but we are in, these communities are in line. Um, and then COVID also did not help anything um, in terms of getting these communities in, but they are in line. So hopefully within the next few years, we'll see these communities join as well. Um, and you will see that Brewster is participating in the program. Uh, you can see all of these communities that, that do participate now, the uh, percentage discount they get on everyone's uh, flood insurance um, policies, and then the total savings. So you can see the total, uh, we're saving $440,000 a year for 3,000 policyholders Cape wide. And as we get more communities into the program, the four that are, are in line now are four very large communities with a lot of policyholders. Um, so once we get those in as well, those numbers will really significantly increase. So with that, I will thank you for your time and attention and Gabrielle, um, I'm happy to take questions if we are doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, please, by all means, anyone who has questions, um, thank you so much, Shannon. That was extraordinarily informative. Sure. And folks are also welcome to unmute themselves um, too, if, if they are. If not, that's also all right. And uh, We'll just give it a second. 
Well, people think, um, I will say, if, if you think of questions later, um, this is my contact information. So feel free to reach out to me directly and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you have. And I think we can also um, hit end on record um, and that will just, yeah, perfect. And then that way,